Welcome to the BB&T Lecture in Free Enterprise. I'm glad you could join us this evening. I'm Faye McIntyre, Dean of the Richards College of Business, and we are pleased to present this evening to you. Uh, we have a long history of collaborating with our business partners, and BB&T is certainly one of the best business partners that we have had. If I could ask all of our BB&T partners who are in the audience to please stand so we could thank you for your help. They're in the back. Would you stand up? BB&T? This evening would definitely not be possible without the support of BB&T, so we do thank them. And if you see one of our community members uh, as you're going out and about, please thank them for their cooperation, for their support uh, of the Richards College of Business. We are in the business of transforming lives through education, engagement, and experiences. So we are happy that we're able to provide this type of opportunity, not just for our students, but for our business partners as well. We hope that you enjoy it. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost for the University of West Georgia, Dr. Michael Crafton, who will provide a welcome on behalf of the university. Please help me welcome Dr. Crafton. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. And so I will somewhat repeat by saying, on behalf of the University of West Georgia, I want to welcome all of you to the uh, BB&T Lectures in Free Enterprise. At West Georgia, we are very appreciative of and very excited to host uh, engaging and influential speakers such as we have here tonight. These, these, uh, these opportunities provide uh, our students and our community an opportunity to explore new ideas, and new ideas not only in the arena of commerce and free enterprise, but new ideas in the larger sense, such as diversity in the workplace with implications of its importance there, but also implications for its importance elsewhere, beyond the workplace, understood in the largest sense possible. And so we are very happy about that tonight. West Georgia is committed to regional and state economic growth and development, particularly since we are one of the largest employers in the area with well over 1,100 full-time faculty and staff. We also are proud to have a significant economic impact in the community, according to the last report, at least that I have, it may not be the very last, but that impact exceeded $455 million. Uh, Finally, we like to say, as Dr. McIntyre did, that we are in the business of transforming lives, and those lives, I like to say, will be in the business of transforming business. Thank you all very much for being here. It is my pleasure now to um, introduce to you the Senior Vice President of BB&T uh, and the Richards College of Business Board of Advisor member, Ms. Tammy Hughes. Thank you, Dr. Crafton. It's my pleasure on behalf of BB&T to welcome you tonight. We're proud to partner with the Richards College of Business to present this series of lectures. And tonight is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Ken Willis. Ken has driven growth turnarounds in virtually every organization he's led by rethinking existing business models, building top tier teams, and vigilantly focusing on execution. A veteran of 35 plus years with Quaker PepsiCo and entrepreneurial ventures, Ken possesses a broad business perspective, gained through experiences in numerous industries and functions, including sales, business development, marketing, finance, and strategic planning. After leaving Quaker PepsiCo, Ken became the president and CEO of Test Tools, Inc., a then burgeoning company that develops and markets test preparation software to schools. In 2009, he founded A New Day Consulting, a boutique consultancy serving small businesses and startups. Several clients and myriad engagements later have led to Ken's most current role as sales and marketing chief for American Academic Capital, a technology startup. Ken's notable accomplishments have included contributing to growing Quaker PepsiCo's revenues by the billions, with a B, conceiving and implementing several major strategic redesigns that influenced corporate-wide go-to-market change and substantial profit growth, as well as the recruitment, mentoring, 
and development of well over 50 former subordinates that have or are leading major divisions or organizations today, many of which include women and people of color. Ken earned his BS marketing degree from Florida State University and an MBA from Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University. He has also completed several self-development programs, including Harvard University's Executive Leadership Seminar, the University of Virginia's Executive Leadership Workshop, and the University of Southern California's Management Program. Please help me welcome Mr. Ken Willis. I can hear me, so that's all that matters. Actually, no. Well, thank you very much for the intro. I am honored to be here at the University of West Georgia. Go Wolves. Wow, that was kind of weak. I'm going to give you one more chance. Otherwise, I'm going to have to report to you and tell the Florida, the Florida State Seminoles that you guys don't know how to do that. Anyhow, I'm honored to be here at University of West Georgia, go Wolves. I'm really honored to speak to this uh, young and this really impressionable group of um, students. It really is an honor. And I think about it in terms of, you know, some of you have mentioned that I have a daughter who's uh, a senior or senior-ish uh, at Florida State. and um, it's an honor for me to do this because there's no way in the world that I can get her to listen to me talk about anything for an hour or so. To have you here, I really appreciate that. I really do. Even though they probably are told that you, they're going to lock the doors and vote you in and bribe you, I really appreciate it and I don't take it lightly. So it's an honor to be here. Um, speaking of my family, let me do a shameless plug and just introduce, introduce them to you right now. That's the Willis Family Bridge in keeping with our theme around bridges, and I'll get to that in a, little, a little later. In the far left picture, um, you can imagine that there's an exciting day because our oldest daughter, Keila, was getting married. And starting from uh, the gentleman to the left of me, that's our son, Christopher. Uh, our youngest daughter, who I mentioned earlier, Keila, or Karina, and the bride, and that day, a couple of years ago, Keila. Loretta is on my right or your left, and Loretta somewhere in the audience, and just trust me, she's here. Uh, the picture on the far right, the only new face that I want to introduce you to is Daniel. Daniel's up in the upper right-hand corner. Daniel is our son-in-law married to Keila, so he's the one that's missing out of that picture on the left. The other would-be suspects are, uh, actually, it's my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, the Joneses. Um, and they are kind of in the middle part of there. You can kind of see Loretta off to the left. And he is my brother-in-law, so when my brother-in-law does come over, yes, I hide the vodka. <coughs> um, we did indicate, and when Faye asked me to talk about this, she said she wanted me to talk about how to build and sustain a diverse talent pool. And you know, the more I began thinking about that, the more I wanted to focus on a profile of individual within that organization. And it's a profile that I came to realize was, for the most part, like me. But I really believe that if you build an organization with a few of these type people and expose them to training along the way, whether the organization is large or small, you're going to attract and you're going to sustain a diverse talent pool. Because here's the thing. Successful people, successful people with the right support structure attract other successful folks, especially if they look like so, let me take you on a journey. 
smooth it down a little bit. Let me take you on a journey, and let me start the journey with Hilton Head, South Carolina. Who's familiar with Hilton Head, South Carolina? Anyone? Yeah, a couple of you. Well, so I'm a hotshot account representative. Over 30 years ago, I started with the Quaker Roads Company. I'm headquartered in Savannah, Georgia, but Hilton Head, South Carolina is my responsibility. And back then, um, about three months prior to my starting, um, there was no way that the only way that you could get to Hilton Head was either via ferry or via an airplane. Now, there were roads on either side of those, of the island or the, or the mainland, indigenous roads, but they weren't built, if you will, for folks to get across. And from a stat standpoint, they probably had about two, two and a half grocery stores. You know, a Big Star, a Winn-Dixie. Well, you don't hear that name anymore, do you? Winn-Dixie. And some other small thing. It was a very small, very quaint place. You literally could see celebrities doing their own shopping in some of those stores. And then a big event happened. They built a bridge. So you had two diverse pieces of land that all of a sudden now are connected. And what happens? Tons of growth. You know, the retail stores now probably have quadrupled the population. Last time I looked, it tripled, probably close to quadrupling, probably in that tripling vicinity. Uh, more golf courses, more uh, resorts. They got a Walmart now, maybe even a couple, Home Depot, you know, the works. And there are opportunities that now abound all because they built a bridge. That's not unlike what happened in New York City almost 300 years ago, 322 to be exact, when the first bridge was built there. 322 years later, it's a $23 million metropolitan area, 23 million people in that metropolitan area, and there are over 16 bridges. Now, this particular bridge by comparison to New York City, it's small in stature, but it's huge in terms of its significance. This marked the beginning of the Selma to Montgomery March some 50 years ago. We've all heard and we've all seen and read an awful lot of things about it. This bridge bridged the gap on civil rights in general and voting rights in particular. So what's the upshot of all of this, Willis? Why are you talking about bridges? Well, bridges connect. They connect people. They connect ideas, cultures, differences. They turn sleepy islands into thriving metropolises. Bridges sustain the ebb and flow of traffic, the ingress, egress. Bridges transform. You've seen my background. And you've seen that for over 30 years, I held a variety of leadership positions, you know, in different levels, account representative, all the way up to whatever it is today. Different functions, I've been in sales, been in marketing, finance, strategy, and different parts of the country. And most of those goals, or most of those areas, my goal was to leave a legacy. In most of those assignments, I was about trying to leave a legacy, to do something or to do a series of somethings that made the organization better than when I found it. Now some of that may have been new programs, it may have been new redesigns, new processes, new roles. So toward the conclusion of a huge change initiative that I was a part of out in the western region, a consultant friend of mine guy by the name of Dave Allen, you know, who had helped us with a lot of major initiatives. And, you know, Dave and we were having dinner one night, and Dave just out of the blue said, um, what do you think your greatest strength is? And that kind of caught me by surprise. I hadn't thought much about it, and I began thinking. I began thinking out loud. And I said, well, you know, um, I think I'm pretty good at this vision thing and this you know, strategy thing. We've done a lot of strategic initiatives and I see job vision and I've seen opportunities to change this and change that and I think I'm pretty decent at that. 
He says, yeah, okay. But that's not it, in my opinion. All right, well, I think I do a pretty good job in terms of change agent and leading change and all of that. Yep, that's good. Pretty good leader, bold leader, that. People, SOP top is called strong on people or soft on people, strong on performance or, yeah, tough on performance. He said, yeah, you know, you, got, you do all of those things, but he says, I think your best skill is a bridge builder. Now, I wasn't sure exactly what Dave meant by that. And I, I was a little, I don't know, I was offended. I thought there are a lot of other things you can call me that I would have been much more proud of. I mean, we've never heard bridge building man, you know. Um, we did hear Agent Maxwell Smart. So, you know, there are some things that, you know, I, I don't know if I was that pleased with. I don't know if that was a good thing. You don't even know who Maxwell Smart is. I'm dating myself, sorry. <laughs> Go to the movies, watch TV. <laughs> um, but that was a good, I didn't know if that was a good thing in search of a better thing. I, I really didn't know. So for the remainder of the time that we have left, I'm going to focus on my journey toward discovering what a bridge builder really meant. And along the way, I'm going to talk about an, its application to diversity, some of the best practices, key principles, and I'd also like to extend to you a personal challenge. But let's start with um, this very erudite, very educational topic called Undercover Boss. How many of you have seen Undercover Boss? Okay, I'm surprised. <laughs> um, Undercover Boss is about a CEO that becomes a frontline worker. And he disguises himself, and you know, come on, you know, at some point, you know, the guy's gotta figure out. I mean, this show is about three years old now, so some of these folks, don't look that different from what they do in real life, and I'm sure that some of them have seen Undercover Boss. But anyhow, let's go along for a second. But he disguises himself. Um, he works with the employees. Um, he screws up normally because he's not accustomed to doing frontline work. Um, but along the way, he has opportunity to sit down and talk to folks. And he understands some of their issues. And then, at the, toward the end, they take a, he takes off the, design, or the disguise and he brings everyone to where the corporate headquarters is and he comes out and they all see, well, he's, you're the CEO. And, you know, it's kind of an emotional thing and um, along the way, he shares with them, you know, you made this recommendation. And I think, and I'm going to implement that. And you said, you know, we had a bottleneck over here, and I'm going to change that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do all of these things, and it's great. And they cry, and they sing Kumbaya, and it's, it's, it's a good thing. My wife loves it. She's hating that I'm kind of talking about it to the extent that I am. But people win. People get prizes, and they get promotions, and they get, you know, vacations, and they get education scholarships and all of that. So that's a great thing for the, for the folks you know, the three or four that have had opportunity to interface with the CEO. And the company wins because guess what? Along the way, they uh, knock some of the bottlenecks down. They create new strategies. They do a number of things that help the company. And I, I like it, you know, in large part. I do have one issue with Undercover Boss. Unfortunately, all of that's episodic, meaning that it happened that time that quarter um, and that fiscal year. And so the question is, what happens next quarter or next year? Well, the headline to me is that management or MBWA, which is management by walking around, works. It works within limited reason or within reason. Undercover Boss takes it a step further and they do management by a W or M-B-W-A-I-D, which is management by walking around in disguise. And that has a limited effect to me over time. 
I think the longer term goal ought to be building a culture that's capable of MBW, AID, in disguise, outcomes that consistently deliver performance on a monthly, a quarterly, and annual basis, even when the boss isn't around. I think that's a critical need. And so I think the critical need there is to have an empowered, proactive, smart, trusted, team-oriented player that sees productive opportunities on a business front, but also is capable of mobilizing groups for change. And that's on the people side. To me, that's what categorizes a bridge builder. And that's what Dave saw in me. So Dave told me that I really had a good skill to not only see the opportunities, but to also bring differing factions together to advance change initiatives. And he described some of the things that I did and that he saw me do throughout that process. Things like seeking different perspectives and really trying to understand someone that had an opposing view. I know my wife's looking at this and she says, boy, if you did that at work, why don't you do that at home? Anyhow, <clears throat> another thing. Is, is the mic on? <clears throat> okay. Um, entertain different ideas, but use facts over emotion, and you work hard to find that common ground where we all win. And here's what I ultimately learned. I learned that as I implemented more of that, and as I also began implementing more diversity initiatives, I began seeing striking similarities in what I had been doing to drive business initiatives and what was required to drive diversity. So let's go to the definition of diversity and inclusion. And it starts with diversity is now any dimension, any dimension that distinguishes differences in people or groups. And it began with race and gender, ethnicity, race, and gender but it has expanded now to include age, culture, disability, diverse perspectives, education, lifestyles, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, and work experiences. The inclusion part, so the diversity is the mix. The inclusion part is how well the mix works together. And it's a process whereby differences are valued and integrated, you know, to maximize two things. Individual contribution. And as me as an individual, as I begin to contribute, and I reach a level of achievement that I am really stoked and excited about, I am fulfilled as an employee. And that then makes a natural side effect or a natural output that the organization is going to perform better because if you have a collection of folks that are stoked and excited and they feel that they're achieving that their absolute potential and they're fulfilled, that collective work is going to provide energy that drives the company forward in culture and programs and products and in results. And this is best exemplified, you know, if you take a look at two of the leading CPG companies you see this mindset within their mission statements. And what you see is that they're striving for a balanced workload that's evident within their mission statements, or balanced workforce, I should say. PepsiCo and Coke. And sorry, folks, I spent a number of years with PepsiCo, so it'll always, I'll always refer to Pepsi first. Then Coke, sorry, I know I'm in Atlanta. But PepsiCo's mission statement reads, reflecting the diversity, our, their, fold, their goal around diversity is to reflect the diversity of their consumer base. Everyone that buys their products, from Gatorade to Pepsi to Frito-Lay to what have you, to reflect that diversity. 
And that enables us to have a better understanding of our consumers. Coke says something similar. Global diversity mission is to mirror the rich diversity of the marketplace. Now here's what they're not saying. They're not saying that we're striving for disproportionate representation. They're saying we're striving for balance, for workforce composition that's in balance with the respective consumer bases, which I think is a really neat distinction. According to the Society for Human Resource Management, they also provide some sound rationale for, for an effort working toward a balanced workforce. And they put down some fairly compelling information in terms of qualitative benefits, which are around improved workforce quality, better return on investment on human capital, but they also list some quantitative benefits as well, and you see them articulated here. Six of the eight largest metropolitan areas of the U.S. are inhabited by minorities. $750 billion in purchasing power between the black, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian populations. And women are primary investors in more than half of the U.S. So you begin to understand the importance of striving for a balanced workforce. Because this is big bucks and you want to have knowledge, you want to have understanding in terms of the consumers that you're serving. Ernst and Young, by the way, our son-in-law now works for Ernst and Young. I'm sure they had nothing to do with me choosing them. Um, Ernst and Young's diversity and inclu inclusiveness kind of goes back to the initial statement. And that's all around their diversity is no longer just defined by race or gender. It encompasses the whole human experience, age, culture, education, personality, skills, life experiences, many other attributes. But they also make that additional statement. It's just not about the mix. It's how well do we make the mix work. It's not enough to go recruit a balanced workforce. It's also the, to the extent that you execute the inclusion part is to the extent that you really maximize the effect of retaining a diverse workforce. Okay? There are successful companies out there, a lot of them to be exact, relatively successful, especially in comparison to five years, ten years ago. Um, and businesses are, we are leading the way. Many companies are realizing this value and they're making great headway in aligning diversity as a key business imperative. This chart represents 10 of the top 50 companies as measured by Diversity Inc. that are performing well in diversity. And the criteria that diversity is using is things like type talent pipeline, equitable talent development, CEO leadership, supplier diversity. One of the things that I began to ponder is as we think about the relative success of, I would say, larger global businesses and how they fared, I began wondering how are the other segments faring? How are communities faring? Some of the troubled communities that we've seen and read about of late. How are they faring? How's Congress faring? How's small business and how are groups? How are they? Um, I think some I don't know. Others, I think we know, and it's not doing as well as we would like to. But I do believe this. I do believe hiring, staffing some of these respective organizations as a first start with bridge building type personalities, type individuals, would, be a, would take a tremendous first step. I would love to see 
a bridge builder mentality unleashed in Congress, and I'm not going to comment any further on that. <coughs> so, in terms of my evolution, to me, the similarities between were there between driving business and diversity. And I saw the similarities because some of the same behaviors that I exhibited in driving business and business change were some of the same things that I felt that I began doing in terms of driving diversity initiatives. And you know what? The reason I felt that way is because they were rooted you know, in the same business enterprise going forward. What I was doing over here to change an organization to such that we could sell more Gatorade and driving change there involved listening and talking to folks, reaching out, seeking to understand, valuing differences and all of those things. As much as it did when we were around building a culture and recruiting and staffing for diversity. So my definition of bridge builder, the Ken Willis version expanded from number one, which you saw on the previous page, which is around seeing opportunities and bringing together differing factions to help work through tremendous, or, you know, significant issues to move something forward. That expanded now to also number two, attracting, mentoring, and developing well-balanced teams. Well-balanced teams, which to me and to everyone else included diverse representation. So, this thing called bridge builders. What are some of the characteristics of it? In my mind, they're big picture focused. And they're end goal focused. They don't get that hung up in some of the minutia of you know, a specific tactic. They're driving the big picture and they're trying to understand and get to resolution around the big things. Continuous improvement mindset. And that drives this constant capability and desire to change when change is necessary. But in addition to changing or change agency, you have to bring folks along with you. It's one thing to have a strong capability to see the opportunities and to have a change bent toward change. But if the, blood, if the battlefield is up bloodied, no one's coming with you. If you're not reaching out sufficiently to understand what the issues are, you're going to know about them sooner or later. And later is not a good thing. I think bridge builders also strive for balance. And what that means is they seldom demand all or nothing. And I think they can impact the organization in various levels, various levels. Even though leadership is important, I think bridge builders can impact the organization because they have the skills and they have the desire to do it. And finally, I think they are essential, essential folks to have as diversity advocates. There are a few examples that I can share with you. And I'll take a couple and try to do that. One was as when I was a Western Region Director on the, uh, in, in the West Coast. And all of a sudden, sales were cascading. They were falling. And we had very hard to reach consumers out on the West Coast at the time. Why? Because they had a lot of dashboard time. They were always in their cars. Traffic was horrendous. Um, and when they were not commuting back and forth to work, the weather was nice, so they hardly ever watched TV. So it was very difficult to reach that consumer with you know, advertising and things along those lines. And you add to that coupons. We all have heard of coupons, right? Well, back then, things like Groupon and some of the sophisticated coupons that are now being mailed by grocers, that didn't exist. The only way of couponing to try to incent someone to buy your new product was via something called a freestanding insert. 
which dropped on Sunday mornings in Sunday newspapers. What's a newspaper anymore? <clears throat> and even then, the redemption rates were, on a good day, 3%. And that was BOGO, and you're literally giving it away, and that's not to say about all of the other fraud that kind of went along with that. So it was very difficult to reach that consumer, very difficult. In addition to that, I mean, the spending efficiency, so as a result of that, the spending efficiencies were all over the place, or inefficiencies were all over the place. And then the customers were getting bigger, and as a result of that, you know, because Safeway was buying this company, and Lucky was buying that one, and Kroger had begun inroads, and all of those things, so customers are getting bigger. And to offset some of their expenses of gobbling up other companies, they're looking to the manufacturers, and they're charging the manufacturers more money for less effect. So they're getting huge and they're demanding all of these things. And in addition to all of that, our process of responding to marketplace, marketplace shifts was extremely slow. If something happened from a competitive standpoint that we saw today, we couldn't get anything on the street for 30 days. And we certainly couldn't proactively plan and lock up a customer's calendar. It was bad. And so, after a few strategy sessions, me and my team devised a solution. And the solution was, we devised bringing Chicago, which was corporate headquarters with the marketing folks and the finance folks, and all of them were, we devised bringing Chicago closer to the customer. To transfer all of the marketing and merchandising dollars from the tower out to the field. So what do you think their reaction was? Oh, can we love this? How soon can we start? Absolutely not. It was the mushroom cloud. And they rattled off all of the issues that they had for good reason. There were no controls in place and it was non-traditional and it's high risk and who are you guys? You guys are sales guys. You're like a wolf in the hen house. You want us to turn them all of the money over to you now? And you guys don't have the skill levels. So listening to all of those issues, bringing division presidents, marketing folks, finance leads, COOs, and all into the fray, as we try to work through this solution, we come up with the following. All of the differences were legit. Yeah, there were control issues, and so the agreement was let's do pre-agreed parameters. That later evolved in something called strategic role of trade. Let's do weekly check-ins. Check on that. All right, well, what about skills and expertise? All right, we will relocate and or hire marketing folks that are in the tower right now and we'll bring them out to the West Coast. And we'll do the same for finance and we'll do the same for supply chain. And you know what, that's a good thing because they can learn more about the customer, they can interface more with the customer, and we can cross train. And we can become better at that. Check. Flexibility to deploy or redeploy funds. Well, let's check up on a quarterly basis. Okay, check. Non-traditional. Well, that really is not an issue, technically, because we have non-traditional consumers that we're trying to reach. Well, it's high risk. Well, let's establish some high risk or high reward goals. And so after we worked through all of that, the outcome was phenomenal. We had results that well exceeded growth plans. We developed transformational change, so a Western Region sales office transitioned from a Western Region sales office to a customer business center, where we had marketing folks and market research and supply chain and finance all huddled around the customer where we can make instantaneous go-to-market decisions. We also had an opportunity to build more diverse leadership into that, including ethnic marketing because we were strong in terms of trying to market to the Latino customer or consumer, as well as the African American. 
consumer. And we couldn't get those kind of programs cookie cut it out of Chicago, but we could do them locally. And finally, customer relationships went through the roof because we were capable of moving up the chain in the, in the customer's eyes and making recommendations and mining um, scanner data, and helping customers make better decisions about where to put items, what aisles, what coupons, et cetera. So what turned out to be, or what initiated, or what started as this huge issue where mushroom clouds were going off all over the place transitioned into an organization and a construct and a go-to-market thing that was really a big deal. There are other examples, but I'm going to move on. Now, the question you ask is, why aren't there more typical, why aren't there more bridge builders? At least that's a question that I ask. And my belief is that some of them get blocked. Some of them start out along that path and there's a path block. Some of it is because it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. It's really hard when you want to move, when you want to be quick and nimble, and you have to bring others along. And I'm not talking about when you have a direct reporting relationship. You know, you're district manager, and you tell the um, account representative to go build a display. Not that. When you're trying to drive change that impacts other organizations and other functions, yeah, that takes a while. Um, but as the saying is, and you're going to hear a lot of isms. And I'll attribute those to our pastor, Andy Stanley. So I'm going to throw out one of Andy's isms, and I'll probably throw out a couple others. But the whole notion is, if it was easy, then everybody would do it. You'd be out of a job. So yeah, it's hard, but it needs to be done. Another is, I tried it once, and it didn't work. And show of hands, how many of you have had a bad haircut or a bad hairdo? But my guess is you didn't stop getting haircuts or hairdos, probably because that was a good thing. You know, at some point, the boss or what have you would say, you need to get something cut or you need to get it in shape. It was the smart thing to do. Or how many of you have had a bad date? But you probably didn't stop dating. I could go into marriage, but I think you get the point. <laughs> Finally, there is, and this is another anti-ism, it's easier to make a point than it is to make a difference. Making a point is finding an area of disagreement. You know, I've mentioned that I'm from Florida State, and last year, after winning the national championship, <coughs> um, they changed the logo of the Seminole base. And it's, a, in my opinion, a relatively minor change. But folks are going, some of them are going ballistic over it. I'm never buying any more Seminole paraphernalia, yeah, 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 yeah. It's easy to make a point and stand your ground on a, on a difference. It's a lot harder to make a difference by pushing through those disagreements and get to a winning solution. So, in terms of wishful dreaming, imagine you're in a world where more, and you fill in the blank, more leaders, more communities, more small groups, more you insert the thing. Imagine if you're in that world where that was more accustomed to pushing through areas of, de of disagreement to find winning solutions. I keep coming back to Congress, but I'll leave it alone. Imagine if you're in that world where you can push through the differences, the areas of disagreement to find winning solutions. That, to me, is a form of diversity. 
and being diversity-minded. So, my personal challenge to you is go build a bridge. And go build a bridge by exercising some of these behaviors. Reaching out. Reaching out to what I refer to as a non-redundant contact, which is someone that's different from you or different from the norm within your network right now. Reach out. Reach out to someone with a different perspective than you. And don't go ballistic when you're trying to talk about it. Seek to understand that difference. Seek to understand it. Give it merit. Seek to understand it. Don't hear the first three words, ah, nah, 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 can't, can't go there. Seek to understand it. But then, yeah, you want to be understood, be understood later. Not forever, but be understood later. But seek to understand that point of view or that difference first. Value that difference, number three. Which is about don't judge. That's a ridiculous idea. That's the stupid, I don't judge. Don't mock it. And certainly don't play to your base. Don't get back, did you, you know, I'm in front of my guys. That was a horrible idea. Value those differences. There's a lot of things that I looked at in preparing for this that spoke to um, folks that are in creative businesses that get great ideas from the most unsuspecting places. And they initially sounded like a ridiculous idea. But you hear it and you tweak it 45 degrees and it's brilliant. So value those differences. Rally around the common goals. What are we trying to do as an organization? What's the big picture? The big picture is getting across the bridge. The smaller issue is, do you do it on a tricycle? Do you do it on a skateboard? Do you do it on a VW? Do you do it on a two-wheeler? That's the small stuff. The big issue is you're trying to get across the bridge, rally around those common goals. What's the big stuff that we're trying to do? More spending power. Oh, good. Well, does it have to be in taxes or this or that? Da, 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 more spending power. Let that be then. Sorry, getting home. Be civil. It's the issue, not the person. It's the issue, not the person. And as you always have heard, it's better to use honey than vinegar. Try honey first. Try honey a lot more times than vinegar. And then the third point in there is C number three. <laughs> Don't play to the base. And finally, synergize. I cannot tell you that list that I showed you earlier in terms of the Western Division or the Western uh, Region, really good ideas came from folks that were adamantly opposed to us making change in the West. But really good ideas came there. And you know what, even if they were horrible ideas, you pick a couple of horrible ideas that don't matter that much and you put them in there because it drives synergy. They're happy now. But a lot of them were good ideas. So synergize, leverage and integrate. And never all or nothing, okay? So finally, Go build, go build a bridge again and start small. I mentioned non-redundant contacts. Just go build a bridge with someone that you don't know. Someone that's different from your network. Or relationship. And as you step up, or a new idea that you would like to implement and so you're sharing it with a couple of folks that it might impact, and ultimately a program. But go build a bridge. And then don't frigging look back. Here's to your success.
Rebecca. That was great. Thank you so much, Ken. I love the idea of that personal challenge, building bridges. Mm -hmm. And I will say to our students in the audience, this is a perfect opportunity to build those bridges with non-redundant contacts. The University of West Georgia is more diverse than it has ever been. We have more African Americans. We have more international students. So the opportunity that is there to reach out to people that don't look like you, but that you can build that connection with. And while you're in university is the perfect time to do that. I want to applaud the first part that you said about more diverse than it's, you ought to give yourself a round of applause. And an excellent rationale for why we in the Richards College of Business have so many of our students do team projects in addition to their Absolutely. individual work. So Absolutely. Good job. Let's Absolutely. thank Ken one more time. And we do have a small plaque to thank Ken for his time here. We appreciate him coming out. That's the flame. Yeah.